I emphasize to people that I want you to stop asking $3 questions and start asking $30,000 questions. We are obsessed with $3 questions in this country. <laughs> uh, can I afford that morning coffee? Um, oh my gosh, the price of Reese's Pieces went up 13 cents. We're obsessed, but we totally ignore the $30,000 or even $300,000 questions, things like asset allocation, mm -hmm. things like negotiating our salary. Those things make way bigger of an impact than the price of coffee. And candidly, buying a morning coffee is not gonna affect your finances over the course of your life. Mm -hmm. But not investing absolutely is, okay? Mm -hmm. So is there a time where it makes sense to focus on smaller numbers? Of course, there are seasons of life. So I know this very well because I grew up son of immigrant parents. We, my mom stayed home with us. My dad worked and we had to be frugal by nature. We had to, it wasn't a fire choice. It was, <laughs> this is how much money we have. And that's that. And I remember this hilarious moment where my parents went into a bank. They had to get a, one of those bank orders or, you know, where they certify it. Mm -hmm. And they came out laughing and I was like, why are you laughing? And they were like, the bank told us that they'll waive the fee if we have $10,000 in our accounts. And they were laughing because it was so inconceivable that they would have $10,000 in their accounts. Wow. And, you know, I know what it's like to not eat out that often, only eat out with a coupon. I get that. And we mm -hmm. needed to do that at that point in mm -hmm. our lives. I have no issue with people being strategic about their spending, about being highly decisive and selective about where they spend money and where they don't. And early on, you do need to build up a skill of knowing, hey, where's my money going? Mm -hmm. I need to track it for a month. Okay. All of that I agree with. I think the problem is that people get stuck doing that. It would be like getting stuck as an adult waddling around like a little toddler. <laughs> of course you don't waddle around. You know how to walk. In fact, you know how to run. That's life. We move to different phases of life. So how come so many of us are still stuck tracking the price of every little thing? How come so many of us are stuck saying we can't afford it when if we looked at your income and your expenses and net worth, you could afford that? How come? And that is because often what got us here is not going to get us there. We need to be able to turn the page on our chapter of life and recognize it might not be serving me anymore to actually add up 50 cent expenditures because I make too much for that to be important. That's really hard for people. And, and honestly, that's what I find extremely enlightening to be able to help people do that. I was listening to your interview with Chris Hutchins on all the hacks and something you said really struck me because I think it encapsulates this concept so well, which is that you you kind of need to be authentic to the the spot that you are in life and the problem is that we don't elevate our approach to money with where we are in our lives and so to your point if you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year you need to level up your approach to your finances accordingly you're not going to be approaching it the way that you did when you were 22 and maybe that 50 dollars savings was actually quite impactful you're a really big proponent of learning how to spend and i think it sounds counterintuitive at first to people who are very well versed in the personal finance world because personal finance is really good at teaching us how to save, but nobody yeah. teaches us how to spend. You'd think that this part would come easily as you've highlighted. It really doesn't for most. This is a very common problem and it has really not been talked about. And over the last few years, it's become, in my opinion, one of the most interesting topics in personal finance. Uh, and that is learning the skill of spending money. I personally love this because I grew up very frugal, very mm -hmm. frugal with, because of my family. And I went, I went to school. I was surrounded by people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And I started hearing things. You know, I had friends who went to work in investment banking in New York. Mm -hmm. And they would tell me like their company would send a black car to take them home every night. And I was fascinated by that. Like, wow, that's not a part of my reality. <laughs> And so I, over the course of my 20s and 30s, I learned the skills of spending, painstaking. I'm going to give you an example. When I graduated from college, I wanted to dress better. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend of mine who's really good at clothes. And I said, will you take me shopping? And she goes, yeah. So she took me. And I had shopped at, you know, like Macy's and Ross and Marshall's growing up, stuff like that. And she goes, all right, uh, 
try this, try this, try, oh, this looks so cool. And she goes, try it on. And I, I went to, I, first thing I did was I looked at the tag. Yep. Okay, classic frugal kid. She goes, don't look at the tag. I go, what? <laughs> That's like someone saying, you know, go to a restaurant and, and close your eyes. Don't even look at the tag. <laughs> she goes, don't look at the tag. I said, why? She goes, first try it on and see if you love it. Then we'll talk about the money. Mm. Okay, that blew me away. But I put myself in her hands. So I was coachable. I was ready to be a good student. So I go and try it on. And when I came out, sometimes she would get really excited. Oh my God, that looks amazing. You definitely should get that. And then sometimes she would be honest with me. I don't love that. Put that back. Mm -hmm. Wow. She was a great teacher. And she taught me that there's a different way to look at money, a different set of lenses. So if we Mm -hmm. imagine money lenses, most of us use the same lens in America, cost. We're obsessed with this lens. But gosh, there's so many other lenses, aren't there? There are lenses of delight. There are lenses of results, like what you might hire a personal trainer for. Lenses of comfort, like why you might hire an Uber or even an Uber black in certain situations. Lenses of security, safety, just there's so many, luxury. And so she taught me that I could take off one set of lenses and use the other. Now, of course, I needed to be able to afford it, et cetera but I could. I have a few techniques that I would suggest anyone who struggles to feel comfortable spending on the things they love can Mm -hmm. use this. So uh, first off, I would ask them, do you understand your numbers? Do you think you will have enough? And this is what they're going to do. They're going to talk, talk, talk. They're going to just throw a lot of words at you. And it's not really going to mean anything. Okay. Let them talk. Because people feel very anxious about money. And so you go, I, I, I totally get that. Do you think you'll have enough? Keep, keep them focused on that mm. question. And when I had this conversation, series of conversations with my parents, I actually created a single document in almost crayon simplistic <laughs> numbers. And my, my dad is quite sophisticated with mm-hmm. money. He has, he has an MBA from University of Chicago. He knows this stuff. Wow. But there's a difference between knowing it and feeling it. Okay, so first I made sure to get my mom and dad involved in this conversation. And I made sure that it wasn't the typical thing of, you know, dad handling the money or mom handling the money. Both talked about it. And they both talked with each other with me facilitating. That was number one. Number two, I said, what are you going to do with this money? Mm. And um, one of the answers that my parents gave was, "Um, I don't know, like give it to the kids. We go, we don't want the money. We have enough money. You taught us how to make money. You taught us everything we know. We want you to spend every last cent and maybe yeah. even more. So again, just articulating that mm. we don't want the money. We, it's not for us. It's for you. Okay, that was another technique. And you can do that lovingly, right? You can tease, you can joke, but you can also say you taught us and we have what we need. You've, mm-hmm. you've really given us that wealth. Um, next, I do this technique I love. I did this with my wife during COVID, um, the 10-year bucket list strategy. And you can do this at any age. You sit down solo or with a partner and you say, what should we do over the next 10 years where if we do it, it would mean that we lived a rich and meaningful life. Mm. And if you're younger, you know, you may, like we pick things like, um, One of us was learning Spanish in Mexico. Another was, I was writing a book in a hotel because I love hotels, et cetera, et cetera. And we just kind of went back and forth like, oh my gosh, what hotel? Wow, skydiving, that's crazy, you know, et cetera. Like having fun, getting Mm -hmm. amped up about it. And then we picked one that was most meaningful to us. And we said, all right, the the, the one for us is a 10-year wedding anniversary in a location we know it's meaningful to Mm -hmm. us. And we said, all right, we know exactly when it's going to be. Let's ballpark how much it's going to cost. So we did a fun little thing. We just guessed. And then we took our number. Our numbers were totally different. My number was way bigger. I was like, we're going with my number. Because if you have two numbers, just go with the bigger one. It forces you to dream big. Yeah. And then we automated it. We said, okay, we know the month and year. So let's just reverse engineer it. And now automatically we're putting money aside every single month. In your that That is the beginning of living your rich life. Final technique is this concept I have called a worry-free number. So many of us, like when we were in college or graduating from college, maybe, if you go to the grocery store and you see a pack of gum, you just get the gum. You're like, all right, 59 cents, 99 cents, whatever. Worry-free. 
The challenge is that as we make more money, we don't adjust our worry-free number up, which we should. Like if I talk to people who make $100,000 a year and they are agonizing over a $20 purchase on Amazon. They're literally creating pivot tables and spreadsheets. <laughs> to, I go, get a life, okay? This is a waste of time. You're wasting my time, worst of all, talking about this. And so we pick a worry-free number. And you can choose, but it could be 20 bucks. Anything below 20 bucks, we're not even gonna think about it. Worry-free, mm -hmm. or I'm not gonna talk to my partner about it. We both agree. The more you make, the higher your worry-free number should be. Why? This, this really trips people out. They go, well, Ramit, if my worry-free number is 500 bucks, are you saying I'm going to spend 500 bucks every single day? No. Why is it that we instinctively go to the worst possible case? Mm -hmm. You think you're going to go from optimizing the price of soup to spending $500 a day at Michelin-starred restaurants? No, this is ridiculous. Be real. You're not going to trip and fall and drop $75,000, <laughs> okay? It's ridiculous. But instead, what you might do is stop agonizing over the price of bread rolls and you mm -hmm. might actually elevate yourself to focusing on stuff that's more meaningful. All of that, and then I'm gonna share one thing I did with my parents. I actually put them on a travel budget, but not the kind you think. I said, this is how much you have to spend every single mm, month. I and they were that. like, uh, what? Like, it was unfathomable. I go, here it is. Now, did they follow my exact instructions? No, but I will say this. They are currently abroad on a tour of a country they love and they're sending pictures to all of us Aww. and we are loving it. And that really is a rich life. It's their rich life. And it starts, it's enabled by the money that they have and the vision that they've put together. I love it. Yeah, people can change. I think it took a couple years of making more money for me not to see everything through the lens of the Chipotle burrito bowl. That used yes. to be my metric of like how many totally. burrito bowls could I get for this amount of money. And it takes time. It really it does. does. I, and I, I've loved your journey watching you as you reflect on everything from, you know, gender, class, um, earnings. I really have thoroughly enjoyed it. And the Chipotle bowl is so subtle and so meaningful. So many of us joke, oh, that if I got more, I'd probably get guac at Chipotle. Ha ha ha. And I go, okay, that's funny. But it's actually not that funny. Mm -hmm. because you're shrinking your dreams down to a Chipotle bowl. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind the jokes. I love money. It's funny. But I also, I, I don't love that we shrink ourselves, that we okay. tell ourselves managing money is making sure things are paid on time. That we say, when I ask people, you know, what's your rich life? What would you love? And they go, well, you know, one day I'd love to have like a beach house. Like it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't even have to have a door. It doesn't even have to have a roof. I'm not even saying it has to have a foundation. I go, what the fuck? I said rich life, not dilapidated life. Why are you shrinking your dreams in front of me in a hypothetical example? What is that? And so I simply don't allow it. And I love that you've elevated yourself beyond Aww. the Chipotle bowl. I think it's amazing and I'm so happy you share oh, that with other people you. too.